Hi, and welcome back to Codex. Our speaker today is Crystal Guo, who is an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam. Professor Guo is an expert in algebraic graph theory, and today she will tell us about strongly regular graphs. Take it away, Crystal. Thanks, Emily. Thank you for having me in your seminar. So I guess there are some, some words that are in the title that I have to define. But maybe the, the larger situation for, for my talk is that, it, um, so most of my, my research now is about the applications of algebraic graph theory in quantum computing, which is why I'm a member of QSoft. But this particular talk is on a, on a topic that is a purely algebraic graph theory topic, which is sort of a novelty for me. And also it's very exciting. So algebraic graph theory is about the interplay uh, between algebra and graph theory. And maybe I should be more specific because I will only do linear algebra. Strongly regular graphs, which were in the title, they're an important class of graphs. Uh, in fact, they have their own book now. This book by Brauer and Van Maldeheim came out in January 2022. Uh, if we want to think about it algebraically, you look at a graph and then you put, um, you take the adjacency matrix of a graph where you have ones if the vertices are adjacent. And then you compute the eigenvalues of this adjacency matrix. So strongly regular graphs are precisely those graphs which have, which are regular and which have exactly three distinct eigenvalues. Um, in that sense, they're sort of like the first uh, non-trivial class of graphs where the algebraic information is still uncomplicated. If you have a graph which with exactly one distinct eigenvalue, then you have to have the empty matrix, the, I mean the all zero matrix, so you have the empty graph with no edges. And then if you have two distinct eigenvalues, then there's only one positive eigenvalue, and you can show that it's a complete graph or a disjoint union of complete graphs of the same size. And then sort of the next thing is that you have regular is that you have three eigenvalues. And then if you add this extra restriction that the graph is regular, you get the class of strongly regular graphs. And now there is uh, now it's an explosion of graphs because um, uh, the other way that you can think about them is that they are a combinatorial relaxation of an algebraic property of having a, a, a automorphism group that is transitive on the pairs of vertices that are adjacent and those that are not adjacent. But uh, you, but because it's a relaxation, it doesn't have to have the group. So you can have strongly regular graphs um, that have no non-trivial automorphisms, and they, and you have many of them. So it provides a rich testing ground as a test class of graphs for for various uh, for various problems. So, for example, for graph isomorphism, before this breakthrough result of Babai that it is quasi-polynomial time. It was believed that graph isomorphism is faster in the class of strongly regular graphs than in the class of general graphs. And there was an algorithm that had a slightly better running time for the class of strongly regular graphs. And uh, another interesting thing, or sorry, another use of strongly regular graphs is they're a good source of infinite families uh, of quasi random graphs like uh, Taylor graphs. How do we construct these strongly regular graphs? And maybe this will be closer to the interests of some of the people in this seminar. So you can construct them using various constructions from coding theory. You can get them from different sets, SQL codes, and various configurations in the leech lattice. Uh, you can also construct them from designs, from symmetric designs, uh, from Latin square graph, uh, sorry, Latin squares, from which you get Latin square graphs, and you can get them from conference matrices. And then another source of constructing many strongly regular graphs is to consider finite geometries and various point line incident structures. So this is what we will do in the talk. And in particular, we will look at uh, strongly regular graphs that are constructed from a generalized quadrangle. Sorry. Uh, so a regular point, it's a concept in an incident structure. So in the big picture, I want to construct graphs, strongly regular graphs, using some geometric object. Uh, in this case, a finite, uh, sorry, uh, a generalized quadrangle. And generalized quadrangles have uh, geometric properties, such as having a regular point. And then, but but when I uh, look at the graph version, I'm in a world of combinatorial data, and I can convert what this means uh, for the graph to have such a thing. So this is sort of what we will do. First, we'll define what does it mean to have a regular point in the incident structure. And then we will translate it to graphs and, and study some topic. 
So yeah, we will look at what this geometric property looks like when you translate it to graph theory. And in particular, um, there's, a, there's a paper from 92 of Gardner, Godsell, Hansel, and Royal, where they classify all strongly regular graphs, where every vertex is what we're calling a regular point. And then with Edwin Van Damme, in our paper, we answer a question in their paper by giving a characterization for all strongly regular graphs where there exists some vertex that is a regular point. So to do this, we have to extend the definition of regular point so that um, it would be something that could happen in a strongly regular graph, even if it were not constructed from one of these um, geometries. And the goal is to uh, understand the structure in these graphs better. And in doing so, we actually construct many new strongly regular graphs. Okay, so now let us proceed to define all the things that were in the title, starting with regular point. Uh, but to do it, it's a thing that uh, lives in an incident structure. So an incident structure, it's a set of points, a set of lines, and an incidence relation between the points and the lines. So you have your points that you would draw in, in, in two space, and then you draw uh, actual lines to denote that these two points were collinear uh, via this line. They're both incident to this line. Okay, and then from this incident structure, I want to get a graph, and there are three candidates for how I make a graph. First, I can have this bipartite incidence graph, of points versus lines. And then an edge is uh, exactly this incidence relation. So the point is adjacent to the line if it were it, it was incident in the incident structure. Then the second choice is the line graph. So here your vertices are lines in the incident structure and there is an edge between two lines if they share a point, i.e. if there exists a point that is incident to both of these lines. And then the third choice is you take your vertices to be the points of the incident structure and they're adjacent if there is a line that uh, contains both points or a line that is incident with both points. Um, you can also say that they're collinear. Okay, and that's the, that's the graph that we will look at. It will be the same as a line graph if you consider a dual duality, but it's simpler to state it this way. And a generalized quadrangle, it has an order ST, and we denote it GQST. It's just a special type of incident structure and the way that it is special is that if you look at a point in the generalized quadrangle, there are t plus one lines going through this point. And if Bill Martin were here, he, he would tell you that, you know, this t thing is short for through, like there are uh, t plus one lines through the point. And then every line has s plus one points sitting on the line. Uh, you can remember that it's an s. It's very confusing because you can have, I don't know, skewer and and also many other words that start with T that don't convey the right information. But anyway, these are just uh, saying the points and the lines are incident to the same number of things. And then the important thing about the generalized quadrangle is this third property, that if you have a point and a line that it is not on, there is a unique line that goes through your point and intersects this line. So there's a unique blue line and a unique blue point such that the blue point is on the line and the, the, the blue line goes through both of these points. Okay, so in particular, you don't have this situation where you have another uh, line that goes through your point and the line that it was not on. So you wouldn't have this triangular situation if you drew it out, um, but you might have many quadrangles or four-sided figures, which is the, the, I guess, the motivation for calling it a generalized quadrangle. Okay, so then if we look at the point graph of GQST, so we, we make the vertices, uh, the points of the graph, and then we put an edge if they live on the same, they sit on the same line. So it has the following property. There are S plus one times ST plus one vertices. Uh, we won't prove this, but we will prove this on a, on a future slide. Every vertex is adjacent to S times T plus one other vertices. If you look at an adjacent pair of vertices, that means that they sit on some line together. There are S minus one other vertices on that line. So they have at least this number of common neighbors. And indeed they have exactly this number of common neighbors. And then if you are a point, uh, two points that are not adjacent, you have T plus one common neighbors, which comes from uh, various situations. Okay, so that diagram maybe is familiar because it is a definition of a strongly regular graph. It's a, a strongly regular graph is a graph that is neither complete nor empty on n vertices, such that each vertex is adjacent to k vertices, each pair of adjacent vertices 
has A common neighbors, and each pair of non-adjacent vertices has C common neighbors. And these numbers that you're gonna collect, this N, K, A, and C are the parameters of the strong regular graph. So the point and also the line graph of a generalized quadrangle, it will give you a strongly regular graph. And a very well-known strongly regular graph that comes from a generalized quadrangle is a Schleifle graph that maybe is spelled with an umlaut. Uh, it's the point graph of GQ24. It's on 27 vertices. It's a very well-known example because it's uh, one of the only known graphs that separates a Lovash theta function from the Shannon capacity. Okay. So I still have to define what is a regular point. So now, now we know what a GQ, what a generalized quadrangle is, and how to get the strongly regular graph from it. So I have to tell you what does it mean for the generalized quadrangle to have a regular point. So here's a definition of regular point. Well, it will be in like a few clicks. So you consider uh, some point in your generalized quadrangle, and I can define this X perp. X perp consists of the points that sit on a line that also goes through x. So x is on some number of lines. It is on t plus one, yeah, yeah, t plus one lines, yes, each of which has s other points besides itself. So there are s times t plus one blue points. Uh, in the graph, it would just be the neighbors of the vertex x. Okay, so these are the things that are collinear with x. So now we have two points. We have x and some point y that it is not collinear with. There's no line through x and y. And I want to define x, y perp. So x, y perp, it will be the points that are collinear with both x and y. So this will happen because y is not, sorry, there are a number, some number, yeah. So y is not on any line that goes through x. So if I consider some line that goes through x, y is a point that is not on it. So by the rules of generalized quadrangle, there is some intersection between some line going through y and that line. So for each line that x is on, there will be a neighbor of y on that line, which we have denoted with these large green vertices. So it's just, you have the, the lines that go through x, you intersect them with the lines that go through y, and because it was a generalized quadrangle, there have to be t plus one of these very large green vertices. It's clear so far? Okay, we're, we're almost at the point where we can define this thing because uh, the thing that we actually wanna look at is x, y, perp, perp. So now I want all the points that are collinear with all of these green points. So I want the set of points that are on some line that goes through a green point for each green point. Yeah, sorry. I want the points such that they sit on lines that go through each of the green points. Maybe this is confusing, but anyway, I want a vertex out here that pierces all of these green points. You might ask, is, your, is this set empty? Could it be empty? It cannot be empty because X is in the set and also Y is in the set. But it's possible that there's some number of vertices down here, some vertices that are not X and also not Y, who are all collinear with all of the green points. This not set is bounded because if you look at any two green points, they cannot have a line going through them or else in my picture, I would be able to draw a triangle. That's definitely not allowed. So they are non-adjacent in the, in the graph and they will have T plus one common neighbors. And this set here is the set of common neighbors, well, together with X and Y, uh, or sorry, it's a subset of the set of common neighbors. So whatever this purple set is, it contains at least two vertices and at most t plus one uh, t plus one things. So the biggest thing that that the biggest number of purple vertices in this diagram is t plus one. And now we can define the regular point. So a point x in the generalized quadrangle is regular if this x y perp perp is as big as it could possibly be for every choice of y. Yeah, so X is regular if no matter which Y you put in here, this X, Y perp perp attains the maximum size, which is T plus Y. So for every Y that is not collinear with X. So it is a bit uh, complicated because you need to define so many perps. Uh, and maybe it would be already of value to say what it means in the graph. But anyway, this is sort of the, the situation we want to extend to the graph. So, so I have a quick question on the previous yes. slide. Um, yeah. So the point is regular if for every choice of y not collinear with x, you get this set has a certain size. 
Um, yeah. Is it true that if you just have an arbitrary point in the generalized quadrangle, that there's going to be some choice of y that gives you a set of that size? Or no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So are there, but are there some points that do have that sometimes for some y have this size, but not for other? Yes. 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 Oh, that's I guess possible. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, All the does every, possible. Does every generalized quadrangle have a regular point? No. Um, are there generalized quadrangles that are so symmetric that every point is regular? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. That exists. We will have an example. There is an infinite family where every point is regular. There's some other infinite family where there is a single regular point. And then there are some infinite families where we do not know how many regular points it has. And somewhere number theoretically, it cannot be. There cannot be any any regular points because of some, so you count some things and S is too small or something. So there is a variety. Okay, so what does it mean for the strongly regular graph to have a regular point? So now we're in this situation where you have the GQ, I take the point graph of it and I get a strongly regular graph. If I did it with S and T equal to two, I would get a graph on these parameter sets and every point is regular in this GQ. So now I hang the graph by a vertex. So I pull out a vertex X, it's regular because every point is regular. I look at the gamma one, which is all the vertices at distance one from X. And I look at gamma two, which is all the things at distance two from X. Every non-adjacent uh, pair of vertices has three common neighbors. So this is everything in the graph. Everything is at most diameter. Everything is at most distance two from the origin point X. Okay, so what happens in the first neighborhood? Well, in the generalized quadrangle, X sits on some lines. Um, and each of these lines will give you a clique of size s plus one. So here, uh, this s has to sit, this x has to sit on many triangles that do not have edges with each other. So you can show that in the first neighborhood, it must be that it's a disjoint union of cliques of size s, which is two in this case. What happens in the second subconstituent? Okay, maybe before we do that, if you're a vertex here, you have one neighbor inside this neighborhood, x is also a neighbor, but you have degree six. So there are four neighbors going forward. And you can do a similar computation to find this. And now what sits here in a second neighborhood? So there are 15 vertices total, one here, six here, and eight remaining in this thing. And you can compute that it's a three regular graph on eight vertices. So what graph is it? How many graphs do you know that have eight vertices and degree three? Is it the cube? Two. Is it the cube? Yes, versus... it is the cube. Yeah, I got it right. Yes. Excellent. The only other graph I knew was a Mobius Cantor graph. Excellent. So the, what sits here is a cube graph, but it's not just that the cube graph sits there. The, gra the cube graph lives there with a marking. So how it looks is that uh, uh, in, this in, in, this, uh, in this neighborhood, the cube does live there and it lives there with a partition. It comes with a partition of the vertices into these decorations that I've drawn. Uh, in Ike. So basically you get not only the cube graph, you get this extra information. It's a cube graph together with the partition of vertices into these uh, color classes here. Okay, so this is what it means for this specific GQ to have a regular point. Uh, and then what we want to do is to, to, to what, what does it mean for general um, strongly regular graph coming from a generalized quadrangle to have a regular point? Well, instead of the cube, you would have a distance regular antipodal cover of a complete graph, which the cube is. And the fact that it's antipodal, that corresponds with these color classes. So this is a generalization that we will discuss more later on. And then you can show that for, uh, for this case, when S is equal to T, that if you're a regular point of gamma two, uh, sorry, if you're a regular point of a strongly regular graph coming from a GQ, then the second neighborhood has to be a distance regular and to little cover of a complete graph. So this is what Gatzel and, um, uh, and co-authors proved in their paper. They proved that if every vertex has this, has this property, then it has to come from a partial geometry and they find the full characterization. I'm sorry, Crystal, okay. can you, I, I missed, yeah. uh, what, what were the color classes? Where did those come from? They come from how it sits inside this neighborhood. Basically, the vertices that are colored the same, they have the same neighbors in the previous neighborhood. I see. Okay, thank you. So you can, yeah, you can color the vertices in this way, and then somehow this coloring is attached to, to the graph. 
Okay, so then uh, more generally, if you have a regular point when S is not equal to T, it gives rise to a four class association scheme with certain properties. So we, we will take this, whatever this is going to be, we will take this to be the definition for a strongly regular graph that is maybe not from a generalized quadrangle to also have a regular point. Okay, so now let's uh, discuss what this actually means on the next slide. Okay, so maybe first we discuss what they actually proved. <laughs> so they determined all strongly regular graphs where every vertex has a regular point. And for them, having a regular point means that the second neighborhood is a distance regular antipodal cover of Kn or Draken because, uh, yeah. And they ask if a characterization is possible when there exists a regular point, but uh, maybe not every point is regular. So what, what we did is we answered this question and we characterized it. And to do this, we needed to extend the definition of regular point to also encompass those cases where the strongly regular graph does not come from a generalized quadrangle. Okay, so now there were some mystery words before. I need to define somewhat what it means to be an association scheme so that I can at least tell you, give you an idea of what, what it, how we extended this definition of having a regular point. So maybe uh, you have seen this before, but maybe not. This is the quickest way I know of explaining what is an association scheme. It's basically an edge coloring of the complete graph. Here I have K8. I colored the edges with three colors. I can break them out for you. There is a red, there are red edges, there are blue edges, and there are orange-ish edges. And now I record the adjacency matrices of my colorings. So I, I create an artificial A0, that's the identity matrix. And then I have A1, the adjacency matrix of this red graph, A2, the adjacency matrix of the blue graph, and A3, the adjacency matrix of this orange graph. And then I get for free that if I sum these AIs, I get the uh, identity, I get the all ones matrix because every edge is colored some color and the diagonal lives in A0. I also get for this particular coloring that the AIs commute. So yeah, these matrices commute. If I consider them as a, a matrix algebra, it's a commutative matrix algebra. And then indeed, this uh, the set of AIs is closed under taking transposes, which is true whenever you have uh, symmetric matrices. And also, this AI, AJ, if I take, uh, if I multiply two of these matrices, they actually live in the linear span of the other matrices. The other way you can think about it is I look at these four matrices, they have some special properties. And one of them is that they generate a very small matrix algebra that basically any multiplication of these things lives in the linear span. So what you get by adding matrix multiplication does not increase the size of, of the matrices that are generated. So now if you have any uh, matrices, any zero one matrices satisfying these uh, properties and maybe also A zero has to be the identity, then this is said to be an association scheme. But of course, our association scheme, this uh, example that I made is even more special because you might have recognized that this A1 is the cube. Um, but maybe it takes longer to realize that A2 is, uh, how did I make A2? Well, a vertex, uh, uh, vertices are connected by a blue edge if they're at distance two in the cube. And vertices are connected by an orange edge if they're at distance three in the cube. So sort of uh, these, other graphs, they record the distance. This is the distance one graph, distance two graph, and distance three graph of the cube. So if you have an association scheme and it happens that A1 is the adjacency matrix of a graph, A2 is a distance two uh, distance matrix of the graph and so on, then the graph is said to be distance regular. And uh, the matrix algebra that you, you get is the both misery algebra, which is also studied for in, in, in more broad context, broader context than association schemes. Okay, so now here is the classification theorem. Sorry, here's a theorem of Ginelli and Lowe, which tell you how a regular point in a generalized quadrangle looks in the strongly regular graph. So if X, if you have a strongly regular graph that comes from a generalized quadrangle and X is a regular point, then the second neighborhood of it generates an imprimitive four class association scheme and this is the eigen matrix. So remember for strongly regular graphs, I had to tell you this N, K, A, and C, these parameters to sort of identify what the graph is. 
for association schemes, it's a little more complicated. I, I need to give you a lot more numbers and maybe it's convenient to think of this matrix as the more complicated versions of the parameters of a strongly regular graph. But, what, um, but uh, uh, if you have looked at association schemes, what you can see from this matrix is that it is imprimitive. And these are the imprimitivity classes. And uh, you can just think of it as that the fact that there is this column in the matrix, it corresponds somehow to the fact that the cube had this coloring into the pairs of vertices. And then the other thing of interest is if you look at this last column and if you substitute the case when S is equal to T, this becomes zero and this becomes zero. And in fact, you don't really have a four class scheme, you just have a three class scheme. So, and you will recover this uh, Draken business that, um, that was in the, 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 the other paper from before. Okay, so now that we have this theorem, we can take this to be the definition of a regular point in any strongly regular graph, even those that do not come from a generalized quadrangle. The numbers will only make sense if you're co-parametric, if you have the same parameters, as something that comes from a strongly regular graph. So there are some restrictions, but basically now we can have this generalization. So now suppose you have a graph, uh, Sorry, so suppose you have a strongly regular graph and its parameters look like they could come from a strongly regular, uh, its parameters look like they could come from a generalized quadrangle. Then I, I take as the definition that the vertex is a regular point if the second neighborhood generates the correct uh, four class association scheme. So this is very general. It will encompass all kinds of things. It's even possible that you have a graph that does come from a generalized quadrangle and the generalized quadrangle doesn't have a regular point, but in the graph, this business, it could still, it could happen from, from uh, the definition. So it's rather broad, but we'll see that it works out nicely for us. And we note that such generalized, uh, such strongly regular graphs, whose parameters look like they come from a GQ, we call them pseudo geometric. Okay, so now let X be a regular point in the pseudo geometric strongly regular graph. Okay, so now we hang it by a vertex again. So we have X, we have the first neighborhood and we have the second neighborhood. And this is sort of the coloring that existed in the cube. So all the vertices inside here, they have the same number, they have exactly the same neighborhood backwards. Uh, in the definition, it told you what has to live here. The thing that has to live here was that association scheme that has four classes and is primitive and has those numbers. Here, you can, uh, so what is left to describe about the graph? Well, you have to tell me what lives in this first neighborhood. If it were uh, coming from a GQ, it would be a disjoint union of cliques, but it doesn't, so we have to prove this. And then you have to describe what happens between these subconstituents. And this is somehow a description of the graph. So first, if we look at this gamma one, we can show that even if it doesn't come from a generalized quadrangle, it is a disjoint union of cliques of size S. So it looks very much like a GQ. And the way that you do this is you analyze the eigenvalues of the second neighborhood and they restrict the eigenvalues of the first neighborhood. And in fact, in this case, it's so restrictive that it can only be the complete graph or unions of the complete graph. And then the next thing is to look at um, this graph that goes between the, the neighborhoods. It's like a bipartite graph. And vertices in the same fiber, like one of these blue boxes, they're adjacent to exactly the same set of vertices on the left side. So you may as well pretend that there are one vertex and discuss what that bipartite graph looks like. And what you can prove is that that bipartite graph is very limited. It can only be what's called the T plus one net of order S. And its point graph is, a, so yeah, there's some, uh, re, there are additional restrictions about how this uh, net lives in there. But this net, I, I guess some people here are familiar with what, what, what a net is. It's equivalent to T minus one mutually orthogonal Latin squares that are S by S. So maybe that rings a bell. Okay, so if you have a, a regular point in a pseudo geometric strongly regular graph, you can break it down into these components. In this neighborhood, we know what has to live here. This thing is prescribed by the definition and between we can show that it has to be T plus one net. So now what is left in the graph? Okay, there's some issue. You can append this vertex X, it's just adjacent to everything here. So there's no choice in how you're building the graph back. But there is only this difference that, I mean, this issue that 
you want to stitch together your bipartite graph that lives here and the actual um, second subconstituent. So now you need to somehow identify vertices of the bipartite graph with the vertices of the graph here. So there are some things to be done. But basically, you can try to rebuild the graph if, if you were given those those ingredients. So if you have your P class, P sorry, the four class association scheme with a prescribed P matrix, if you have a correct T plus one net of order S, and you have a bijection between the fibers and the points. So this bijection is just to stitch things together to tell you which vertex of the bipartite graph in the middle will be identified with which fiber of the uh, of, of the of the graph on the second subconstituent. You can stitch them together to make some graph if I were given these ingredients. And it's some graph that takes in these things as input. And what we show is that every possible way of stitching them together results in a strongly regular graph. And it has a regular point by construction. So basically, this is if and only if. So it has a regular point if and only if. These are the bare necessities that you need to have if you were indeed a regular point. And then uh, what the, the theorem says is that if you have these ingredients and you stitch them together in any way, that is, that is going to be strongly regular. It's clear that when you stitch them together, the graph looks strongly regular from that special point of origin X. It's less clear and you need some linear algebra matrix theory to show that for all the other vertices, this also works out. But that is indeed true. So now one, one may ask, what, what does it mean? What does this theorem mean? Well, here's what it means. So in our, in our theorem, there was actually no restriction on phi. Phi is just any bijection. So there were no restrictions. This has to be a very special object. The H is whatever it was in the theorem, but there was actually, it was, this was true for every choice of phi. So what you can do is how strong this theorem, well, you, let's see what it can do. So if you start with a strongly regular graph that has a regular point, you can mess around with the phi. This bijection, you can change it in any way that you want. You can uh, apply any automorphism. Uh, and get a potentially different phi. And then you can construct another strongly regular graph with a regular point that may or may not be isomorphic to the one that you started with. So we do prove some, in, we, we find some families of infinite, uh, 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 some infinite families of strongly regular graphs. So the Hermitian generalized quadrangle, it's a GQ parameter set Q squared Q. We do this procedure to it, it has a regular point. So we do this, it has, uh, yeah, I think it's transitive. So uh, all the points are the same. So we do this procedure to it and we can find that there is another strongly regular graph by choosing a different phi uh, that is not, that does not come from a generous quadrangle but it does have a regular point. And this is an infinite family that's not equal to the original graph. For WQ, which is a GQ with parameter QQ, it's called the symplectic quadrangle. This is the infinite family where, uh, or maybe another infinite family where every point is regular. We can show that it has at least Q strongly cospectral uh, graphs that have the same parameters, which are not geometric. They don't come from GQs and they do have regular points and they're not isomorphic to each other or this original WQ. So this was a pretty happy result because we get very many, uh, we get a very large infinite family. We get Q for every Q. Uh, and this exists for uh, all, all prime powers Q. So this is really nice, but you can just plug this into the computer. For Q equals four, what we actually find on the computer is we find 100,000, at least 100,000 new strongly regular graphs that are not this one. They're not each other and they were previously unknown. So of which we proved that four are, are distinct. And then also for Q equals five, this is now like very large and uh, it's very trying for, for your computer to try to compute these things and whether or not they're isomorphic. But we found over 20,000 new graphs that are not each other and also not the original graph. And they all also are not coming from a geometric construction. And of those, we proved that, you know, five of them are, are new. But anyway, this Q will also go to infinity. But basically there are many uh, families out there these, these strongly regular graphs, it could belong in other families and maybe there's other ways to, to characterize it. Okay, 
so now uh, maybe uh, uh, so so right so so this characterization it was meaningful because we uh, as sort of a proof that this the characterization is doing something just by varying these uh, the bijection we can construct many new strongly regular graphs by breaking down the structure of an existing one. But we can actually do more than this. Uh, in the generalized quadrangle WQ or any other GQQQ, this is the, the motivation. So I think it's Stanley Payne who defined a regular point, and he defined it because he wanted to create other generalized quadrangles. So what always happens for such a generalized quadrangle is if you have a regular point, you can look at this second subconstituent, the fibers. So this was a coloring on the cube. They were uh, vertices that were not adjacent to each other. They have exactly the same neighborhood in the previous um, uh, previous neighborhood. And uh, it's a partition into co-cliques. You can replace all the co-cliques with cliques. So you just add all the edges to make these little graphs complete. So then if you look at the second neighborhood with the added edges, that will give you a generalized quadrangle Q minus one, Q plus one, if you started with a GQ. So this was the, the source of uh, the definition. Of, this was the motivation for defining regular points. It was to construct other generalized quadrangles. But now we can do this to our graphs as well. So what happened for GQQQ? This was a thing where for GQ44, we found over 100,000 new graphs. By construction, they each have a regular point, the point that we used. But by, you know, miracle, because there are like 100,000 graphs, so we have 100,000 chances to hit a miracle, there could be like another regular point in the generalized quadrangle. And it could be different from the one that we constructed, or not in the same orbit of the automorphism group. So indeed, that does happen, that by some sort of miracle, you do all these uh, uh, permutations, and you obtain uh, by accident, or maybe not by accident, maybe this is something that could be uh, be proven that you can get some other graph that has two regular points, one that is not equivalent to the original one. And now you can do this procedure to the other regular point. You can take its second neighborhood, you can insert cliques as required, and you can get a new graph. So these we did not find an infinite family, but you can, for example, construct a new strongly regular graph on these parameter sets by just exhibiting it and showing that it's not one of the previous ones that we know. There are very few graphs in that class that were known and they were all vertex transitive and you can show that the thing we get here is not. So it, yeah, you can also get uh, um, many other graphs in, in many other ways. So maybe this is also something that, that could be done. So, so to conclude, um, I want to show you this open problem that, uh, right, so the pseudo geometric strongly regular graph, that's the strongly regular graph that has the same parameter set as if it would come from a generalized quadrangle. It's geometric if it does come from a generalized quadrangle. And there's a very well known theorem of Cameron, Hussels, and Seidel that if you have the same parameters at GQ, QQ squared, then you have to be constructed from a generalized quadrangle. So this class is geometric. The only graphs that are in it must come from, from geometries. And then the following uh, generalized or pseudo GQs are not geometric. So this Q squared, Q cubed, Q minus one, Q plus one, and so on. And this infinite family is coming from our paper and the other blue things. There are some contributions from this paper. There's an infinite family here, and but it's first found by von der Flass in 2002. And if you're familiar with generalized quadrangles, you would know that there are not so many infinite um, uh, parameter sets where they exist. In fact, it's these and one more, the dual of this. So the only open uh, thing is Q cubed, Q squared, whether or not it's possible for this GQ to have a cospectral made that is not itself a GQ. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna end here. All right, let's thank Crystal for that talk. Smash that reaction button.